This video is brought to you by Fishing Clash. Enjoy fishing in numerous exotic locations like the Great Lakes, tropical Nicaragua, or the Mediterranean Sea, and level up by catching various types of fishes, from strong teeth hogfish, great barracuda, red snapper, to even a prehistoric megalodon shark. Fishing Clash is a game that pulls you into play for hours, asking you to be patient, persistent, and competitive, while providing you with realistic, lifelike fishing encounters. Don't underestimate your prey as you can easily run out of catch. Pick new and advanced fishing rods by leveling up and hunting down your next catch, or compete head-to-head -head with other fishermen through weekly PvP events as the game is free and available on both iOS and Android. New players can use the gift code FISH WITH SIMPLE HISTORY and get a special reward. A three-star rod to get more bonuses on your rod. The Florida Pro License to increase your speed, catch change, and get more points overall. 50 luck power-ups to help you get the fish you want. 30 weight power-ups to help you catch bigger fish. All this for a total value of $20. Download the game from the link in the description and start your unique fishing journey. Australia, 1935. Was it a shark attack or murder? 1935 looked like it would be a good year. The world was slowly recovering from the Great Economic Depression. It was the year Elvis was born, and no one thought for a moment that the German Chancellor Adolf Hitler was anything more than an irritable nationalist. No one could have imagined that in just four more years, Hitler would plunge the world into a Second World War that would ultimately end up costing an estimated 70 to 85 million lives. In Australia, life was good. The country had just gotten its own international airline, Qantas Empire Airways, or the Flying Kangaroo, and the feel-good American Civil War comedy Little Colonel, starring Hollywood child superstar Shirley Temple, was charming audiences all across Australia. So, early one April morning, about a mile off the coast of Sydney in East Australia, businessman Bert Hobson and his nephew Ron were checking some lines they'd baited with mackerel the previous night. Bert had hoped to catch a shark to sell to the local aquarium, which was run by his brother Charlie. Much to Hobson's joy, he found he was in luck as he'd caught a small shark. But to his surprise, he found it had been half devoured by a much larger tiger shark, who in the process had gotten itself entangled in his other lines. The tiger shark was massive, measuring around 14 feet in length, and along with the legendary great white shark, was one of the most vicious predators in the seas around Australia. So, Hobson put a rope around the shark, secured it to the back of his boat, and cut it free of his lines. He then towed the shark ashore. His brother paid him good money for the shark, and it was displayed at his aquarium as the new star attraction. It quickly proved incredibly popular, as crowds flocked to see the tiger shark menacingly circle angrily around in its large pool. Then, after just a week, it started to look ill and threshed weakly around in its tank. Charlie was starting to worry about his new investment, as none of the great predator sharks had ever lived more than a few weeks in captivity. His concerns were well-founded, when that late afternoon it went into convulsions and then violently threw up. The crowd gasped and looked on in disbelief, not because this mighty predator had regurgitated a dead rat, a decomposed bird, and part of a much smaller shark, but also a human arm. The arm was fished out of the water, and the police were called in. The severed limb was in surprisingly good condition, having only recently been eaten. It turned out it was a left arm belonging to an adult male, with a distinct tattoo on it of two boxers fighting. Also, the police were able to lift a good set of fingerprints off the dismembered arm. It was first thought that it might have belonged to a swimmer who'd been an unwitting victim of a shark attack. But as no swimmer had been reported missing in the area, the police quickly dismissed this possibility. They also became suspicious about the cause of the man's death, as it turns out the arm had been dismembered with a sharp knife and not bitten off by a shark's bite. So police were now convinced the man was a victim of murder. Then they managed to establish from the fingerprints in the tattoo that the arm belonged to a 45-year-old local petty criminal by the name of James Smith. 
He ran a disreputable billiard hall downtown and had been reported missing by his brother a couple of weeks before. On the morning of his disappearance, he'd told his wife that he was leaving home because he was offered five pounds for the week to drive a fishing party about. It later emerged he'd actually gone to play cards and drink with friends, one of his closest being a criminal by the name of Patrick Brady. However, when they went to question Brady, he'd already fled his home and gone on the run. Later the next month, he was arrested on check forgery charges. This allowed the police to hold him for a while and question him about Smith's disappearance. But as he told them very little, and there was no real case against him, he was only charged over the check fraud and released. Then a little while later, the police thought they got the big break they needed in Smith's case. A witness, who was a taxi driver, came forward and linked Smith's movements that day to an associate of his, Reginald Holmes, a well-known fraudster and smuggler. But when they brought him in for questioning, Holmes denied any involvement in Smith's disappearance or death. The police frustratedly were forced to release him too, as they had no grounds to hold him. So this might have been the end of the matter. However, four days later, a troubled Holmes tried unsuccessfully to commit suicide by shooting himself in the head, but the bullet struck his forehead and failed to penetrate the skull. The police were called by concerned neighbors, and Holmes ended up fleeing the scene in a speedboat, leading the police on a high-speed chase around Sydney Harbor before being arrested and taken to hospital. Once detained, Holmes decided to enter into a plea deal with the authorities and confessed to what had really happened to Smith on the day of his disappearance. He claimed that Smith and Brady had met up at a rental cottage by the coast to discuss an insurance scam they were planning involving a yacht. But after a heavy drinking session, Smith and Brady were now both drunk and had a falling out over how the money they would get ought to be divided up. In a drunken rage, Brady killed Smith, then dismembered and disposed of the body at sea in a metal trunk. Brady then allegedly took Smith's arm to Holmes' house and threatened Holmes with it to extort money from him. Afterwards, Holmes said that he had thrown Smith's arm, which Brady had left with him, into the sea to get rid of it. Police now felt they had enough evidence to arrest Brady and charged him with Smith's murder. But a week later, on the day of the inquest into Smith's death, Holmes was found dead in his car in an apparent suicide. Though police felt it was so far too staged and that it was suspicious a suicide victim shot himself in the head three times. At the inquest, Brady's defense argued that though the arm was undoubtedly Smith's, it didn't necessarily mean that he was dead. Bizarrely, the coroner agreed with them, saying that without the whole body, they couldn't know for certain that Smith was dead and therefore couldn't rule that he had been a victim of foul play. The police nevertheless went ahead with the trial against Brady. But after just two days, the judge instructed the jury to find Brady innocent, as he felt Holmes' statements were unreliable, and as the witness was dead, he couldn't be cross-examined. As the prosecution could offer no other evidence, Brady was acquitted. Smith's body was never found, and Brady continued his life of petty crime, spending over 20 years in jail. Brady died in 1965 of a heart attack at 76, having just been released from prison. Throughout his whole life, Brady always maintained that he was innocent. In fact, in a more recent contribution, the historians Roop and Meager argue that Brady didn't murder Smith. They believe Brady had no motive to kill his friend, and rather it was associates of Holmes who were guilty. For shortly before the murder, Smith had blackmailed Holmes for not receiving any reward after botching an insurance scam which Holmes orchestrated. Smith's blackmails could not be tolerated, and he had to be removed. As of today, the crime is classified by the Australian police as unsolved. But who do you think did the crime? Leave your theories down below and maybe you'll be the one who can solve the case. This video has been made possible by Fishing Clash. Click the link in the description to download Fishing Clash and join us in the next fishing adventure.